Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. Good afternoon, Team Crew Lab community, and on behalf of Marine Corps University, the Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Brew Crew Lab Center for Innovation and Future Warfare, welcome back to the Brewcast, our series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best in innovative and creative thought. I'm your host, Major Ian Brown, Operations Officer at the Crew Lab Center. Before we begin, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Crew Lab Center, Marine Corps University, the United States Marine Corps, or any other agency of the U.S. government. So today, um, we're fortunate to welcome uh, some of our neighbors here aboard Quantico from the western side of the base, which uh, sometimes you sort of feel like there's a like an invisible force field that um, makes 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 it hard for things to you know sort of permeate by osmosis through the two. But um, at the Kulak Center, we've been trying to to do better about um, and about making some of those connections and bringing the work that goes on um, at the various tenant entity, entities over there to the audience here. And I think, and today is a good example of that. But today also, I think is, we can look at as a continuation of some of those sort of higher level conversations that we had with, um, with folks like the Assistant Commandant and the Sergeant Major looking kind of very high level at, you know, what are the, what are some of the, the changes, the, you know, the big muscle movements that Force Design 2030, Talent Management 2030, all that. You know, it was going to do for the Marine Corps of the future. And, you know, a lot of that stuff may not necessarily in the moment impact, you know, what does what the Marine Rifleman do? Or what is the Marine going to see, um, you know, in the practical um, granular sense um, in their in their sort of near term future and then intermediate future. But I think it's a great example of bringing that, bringing all those concepts down to practical application to things that are going to impact the majority of those Marines out there. And as every Marine is a rifleman, you know, potentially impacting every single Marine that we have in the force. So uh, to talk us through this today, um, we have uh, two gentlemen from the Weapons Training Battalion Quantico. And uh, our first guest here is Colonel Greg Jones, who's the commanding officer of Weapons Training Battalion Quantico. He was commissioned in 1997 as an 0302. He served in both the 1st and 2nd Marine Divisions, Indo-PACOM, Marine Corps Recruiting Command, and Training Command. He's a graduate of the Infantry Captain's Career Course, Marine Corps Command and Staff College, and the Air War College. He deployed to Operation Iraqi, excuse me, Operation Iraqi Freedom on three occasions with 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, including as the commanding officer of Alpha Company and as the battalion operations officer. He deployed to Afghanistan in support of Operation Enduring Freedom in 2018 as the operations officer for Task Force Southwest 18.2. He's commanded both Infantry Training Battalion East from 2014 to 2016 and Headquarters Battalion 2nd Marine Division from 2019 to 2020. Prior to assuming command of Weapons Training Battalion Quantico in July 2022, he was the Assistant Chief of Staff G3 and Chief of Staff for the 2nd Marine Division. And our second guest today is Gunner John Costa, who is the Director of the Marksmanship Program Management Section, um, or MPMS. Uh, MPMS researchers, develops, assists in implementing, and manages all marksmanship training for the service. I'm saying service like with capital S, Marine Corps service. Gunnar Costa enlisted in the Marine Corps in 1998 as an 0351 assaultman. He became an 0317 scout sniper in 2004 and later served at this, as the staff NCOIC of Scout Sniper School aboard Camp Lejeune. Gunnar Costa was commissioned as a Marine Corps gunner in 2014. And as such, he served with 2nd Battalion, 8th Marines, 2nd Recon, and at TTECG. So, gentlemen, welcome to both of you. I'm very happy to uh, to learn more about what's going on at Weapons Training Battalion, but all, but particularly some of the advancements and changes that are going to start coming down to Marine Corps marksmanship, which, you know, we, we hit that drum a lot. Like, every Marine is a rifleman. So this is, you know, really the bread and butter of what we do. So uh, welcome, and I'll uh, uh, turn it over to, uh, to the two of you to get us started. Yeah, appreciate the time in, uh, obviously, as long-time infantry Marines, uh, marksmanship in general is near and dear to our hearts, but specifically uh, some of the work we're doing in the Advanced Marksmanship Training Program, or AMTP, uh, is, is specifically important. Just for everyone's edification, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what Weapons Training Battalion does first, just so folks can understand, so how, do we, how we got from the west side of the base over to the Krulak Center talking about innovation. Um, just to be specific, I'm going to read the mission, um, but our mission is to serve as the Marine Corps proponent for all facets of small arms, combat marksmanship, and be the focal point for marksmanship, doctrine, training, competition, equipment, and weapons. Now, specifically with equipment and weapons, we, we don't compete with CISCOM and really any 
marksmanship related equipment or weapons or for the shooting teams and we go through appropriate appropriate venues to uh to acquire in anything that might not be directly service related <clears throat> inside the our mission we're the opr or office of primary responsibility for two service orders that we route through obviously cg training command but up to general IMS at training and education command for signature one is an order that a lot of folks know it's the marine corps Comment marksmanship program, and really there, that order just prescribes the policies uh, and, and scheme of maneuver course of fire for the annual rifle training, which is done uh, for lieutenants and at the depots, and uh, and the ARQ, which is the new uh, course of fire um, for the for the service uh, once you're in the FMF or the supporting establishment, and obviously the service pistol. The second order that we're in charge of is the competition and arms program, also known as the small arms marksmanship competition order. And that program, uh, we basically do Marine Corps marksmanship competitions, formerly known as, as division matches. But that program's designed to enhance uh, marksmanship uh, competition across the Marine Corps, but specifically, again, as a, as a service um, uh, organization or a, a, an organization that represents the service in competition of arms. It's designed to increase the combat effectiveness of the total force. And we're in the first week of uh, Marine Corps Mark Street Competitions National Capital Region out at Weapons Training Battalion Complex. We have folks from OCS, TBS, Makayak, um, a gun and a sergeant from the Joint Postal School, a captain from JIF North, captain and a sergeant from, from MARSOC. So definitely an opportunity to, to raise everyone's game through the expert uh, <coughs> Marines we have on the shooting team. That's generally sort of who we are, what we do. And uh, we do some other things, but uh, the primarily the, the marksmanship related focus for us, uh, for the service. Great, thank you, sir. I think that, you know, I'll include myself in this, but I think that's important to note that this is, you know, not just, this isn't just the range on Quantico, this is service level marksmanship, which uh, is, is a pretty big deal for us as Marines. Um, <clears throat> so moving into kind of some of the, one of the main things we wanted to bring to light today, which is, Talking about um, what what changes and adjustments and reforms are coming into marksmanship for the Marine Corps under the uh, the Advanced Marksmanship Training Program. So, um, if you want to, Governor, I'm sure you're going to take that one off. I certainly am. Yeah. So, what what is this thing? What uh, where does it come from, and what is it going to do for the service? Yeah. So, uh, to frame the audience, um, uh, the Advanced Marksmanship Training Program, we refer to it as AMTP. Um, I'm going to kind of walk you guys through, you know, what it is. Um, what's happening with it right now, and we'll discuss kind of how we got to this point and then talk about potential uh, pathways in the future. Um, up front, though, I'm from Boston, so turn your subtitles on if you have a hard time understanding me. Um, but Advanced Marksmanship Training Program, uh, essentially we're talking about improving lethality uh, within the infantry and how we're defining lethality, because that can be somewhat of a nebulous term depending on, on the context that you're speaking about it. Um, we define marksmanship lethality as the repeatable capacity of a system comprised of an individual weapon and ammunition to rapidly incapacitate an enemy, enemy combatants, uh, through a physiological stop likely to result in death. There's a lot of things to unpack there. Um, that is the lens that you need to look at this from, right? So if we're talking about training a guy, uh, we're talking about consistency. We need the enemy killed and we need them now. That requires a lot of accuracy and that requires speed. Um, so the program itself, uh, AMTP, it's aiming at creating incorruptible weapons handling um, by enforcing accuracy um, coupled with speed. Uh, it's it applies some different methodologies from the standard marksmanship program that we've had for um, um, that we've recently um, um, implemented and we've had for you know over a hundred years. Um, those methodology differences um, to highlight a few would be we have some training drills associated with this program, right? Um, those training drills are extremely difficult in terms of accuracy and uh, speed. Um, those two things are not decoupled. Uh, right, they're they're, um, they're evaluated together, like they're equally important. Right, um, the training program itself, um, it we all heard the phrase um, "practice makes perfect." This emphasizes on perfect practice makes perfect. So it's not enough to just oh do three hours of repetitions of this one drill and you'll be fine. It doesn't work that way. 
Um, we will show you this is the technique, for example, how to reload a rifle at night under the clock and still hit what you're aiming at. Um, but you'd have to do it this way. So it's almost like drill level precision. Um, the techniques are um, usable throughout just, I'm given a rough number, like, you know, 90% of combat conditions there. There's always those one-off scenarios where you, you got to reload a gun upside down from a helicopter, right? Like, but generally speaking, um, they are done up not as if you're on the range. They're done up as if you're in the gunfight. Um, time, this is a, a drastic departure from, from the norm. Um, time is really based upon the student. So how well the class is absorbing the information, how well they could perform the tasks. Um, when we run these packages, you know, I hope my infamous phrase is, don't ask me how long day one is. Um, I've seen them go all the way to zero three. Um, sometimes they go to 2200. It's all driven upon the class and like how well they're uh, absorbing the info and ready to uh, progress forward. Um, we evaluate them with a pre and a post test. Uh, key part with these is uh, one, we measure performance. You can really see, you know, the rate of improvement. Um, but two, there is no warm up. It's performance on demand. Like do it now. You get your range safety brief. You briefed what the test is as a course of fire, get your ammo and let's go, do it now. Um, we've trained, and I'll cover this in a minute, but we've trained like a, um, um, a lot of different demographics from like IOC captains, we had some MOSOC Marines, we typically get NCOs, staff NCOs, right? It's like runs the gamut. So sometimes you can get guys who come into the course with, you know, um, good marksmanship fundamentals, great backgrounds and, and um, you know, they, they kind of think they know everything. They'll shoot the pretest, and and more often than not, find out that that is not entirely true. Mm -hmm. um, so the pretest is also helpful in that regard. Um, we incentivize performance. Um, there's a few little tricks that we can do for that, um, but it pays to be a winner. Uh, conversely, we unambiguously identify failure. So we're not hiding failure. It's not everyone gets a medal and great job, but you need to improve. It's no, you failed this. This is how you fix it. Let's take corrective action and get you where you need to be. Um, it emphasizes on uh, instructor ability. That sounds, you know, oh yeah, common sense. The fundamental difference here is when we say performance on demand for the student, the same thing is true for the instructor. So I'm going to demonstrate my ability to you, like you're going to see me shoot these drills. Whatever task we ask you to do, we're going to do it too. And you'll see us pass it. Sometimes you see us fail it, that's real, and we own that failure. But you're doing what I'm telling you, not by virtue of rank or billet, but because you just saw me actually do it and you saw me do it well. That's all predicated upon, again, these training drills are extremely difficult. If it was easy, no one's impressed, right? Um, it, the the techniques themselves are um, the drills are broken down into pieces and pots. So typically, when you do marksmanship for just just a random example, you may have some sort of a drill where you present the weapon, fire several rounds, reload, and fire several more. Right? That's a lot of stack tasks. We're looking to isolate um, each component of those techniques. So you would see a one shot presentation drill where all you're doing is presenting the weapon, firing it, trying to hit a certain size target in a certain time standard. There would be a separate drill for reloads and there would be a separate drill for recoil management where you're firing multiple rounds. Um, again, this is where this whole program is just drastically different um, from what's currently been, well, what's generally implemented. General marksmanship training, even outside of the Marine Corps, you know, you do some practice shooting of a test and you kind of break the test down a little bit and then you shoot a pre-qual and a qual and it's like you're good. There's efficacy in practice. There's efficacy in shooting a test, but it's not the same as training. So the final rub with AMTP is it's a, it's a training program. It culminates in a test known as the infantry marksmanship assessment. At no point when we run these courses do they rehearse the test. Doesn't happen. They shoot it pre-test, cold, they shoot it post-test cold. So post-test is on the last T-Day. They show up that morning, load up, and we go. And it's the last time they're firing around is under pressure. Um, so that's just a general overview on, on what the program it is, uh, is itself. Currently, 
we have two courses. They're not POI'd yet. Uh, Web Training Battalion uh, Quantico runs an AMTP initial course, and we run uh, an instructor course. So you you know go through the uh, initial to be able to then go through the instructor and train it. Um, what we've been doing is certifying SOI instructors right now to implement it within the Infantry Marine course. Uh, that AMTP was selected in last December by CG Training Command at the time, General Alfred, um, as the primary marksmanship training method for IMC, uh, the Infantry Marine course. Um, so we are involved in that in um, certifying those combat instructors to be able to then teach it. Uh, so we're our primary role at this point, we're trying to transition into just running the instructor package, allowing the SOIs to run the initial themselves with guys who we've certified. Um, and that's that's generally current ops right now. Um, we're opening it up slowly to uh, the infantry FMF. Again, it was designed for the infantry. Um, and that's the general state of the union. I think you, when we sit there and say like, how, where did this come from, right? This is when we start talking about the past. I'm like, what were we doing that required a, such a, a drastic shift in methodologies? Um, yeah, and actually that was gonna be one of the please. questions I had for you. So, you know, as you described, you know, I had um, pilots on, so I'm, I'm less probably familiar and have touch points with the right, you know, the marketing program, but, you know, it's still an annual thing, right? Um, but, you know, I'm, from my memories of that and, you know, from, um, you know, what I know of the, the like, sort of the old marksmanship program as you described it. What you described just now is uh, it's a very different animal. So, you know, one, not knowing like when it's going to end kind of thing is a, uh, that's a new thing. And I imagine that has some, some challenges. Um, oh, it definitely does. Because like, if, if you can't <laughs> tell, like, you can't tell the unit, hey, your Marine's going to be back, you know, you get it back in two to three weeks or whatever. You can tell them, yeah, I don't know when it's going to be done. They might be like. Oh, well, the, for, the, for the T days, we'll, we keep it at 10. Uh, we keep it at 10 T days, but again, the length of some of those days is it's not clear. Um, we do a lot of like uh, um, ORM work behind the scenes, like nobody's driving, right? Like everybody gets a squad bay and we walk there and that's where we're sleeping. Um, but that's, um, yeah, that not knowing what time today is going to end, just knowing that, hey, don't plan on, you know, if you're local, don't plan on going home tonight. We'll, we'll tell them that much. Sometimes they can go home, right? The class accomplishes the task, like, great, you guys can go home. But um, and if I, I, sorry for a point of clarification, it's uh, the full package right now, the initial package is uh, day night rifle uh, and day pistol. Um, of note, the standards um, for day and night rifle are exactly the same with one exception. Um, there's, a, there's a short bay and long bay um, but there's a, uh, you got to shoot a 300 uh, meter target uh, during the day and during the night. The size of that target changes at night and it's due to equipment limitations, which I don't even want to dive into that right now. But it's an equipment issue. It's not a capability issue, like by the, by the skill, like by the individual. But other than that, everything else is the same. Like the short base standards are exactly the same. So just because it's at night, we don't. It's not like, oh, we'll make it easier on you. You only have to, you shoot this drill in two seconds now instead of one. Nope. Like, it's the exact same. Sorry. Yeah, and, and we definitely don't have to go down to equipment rattle at this point. Um, but in, in just still comparing the, the old version with the new, um, whole thing just I noted here is one, like the fact that at the time, the training days based on the students' capabilities is, you know, what we would call over here that this is like in a, an adult based learning or yeah. student. student student focused learning as opposed to instructor, but also the fact that the instructors have to like do and show the same thing to, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I'm characterizing this right, but they have to show their own credibility. 100%. Um, so that this is a new a new thing, right? What was, so in the old one, what necessitated the change in the shift towards that kind of focus both on more, more flexibility to for the individual student by their own capability, and then the instructor having to prove their own credibility yeah, so I I want to um I want to point it um over to Colonel Jones here for uh, just some uh, background context, but I'll I'll pass the baton with think industrial age model, which I think it was up until fairly recently that was a lot of what we were doing 
uh, in terms of marksmanship. So with that, I just I pass it to yeah. you, sir. And so we're obviously biased, but as Gunnar and I prep for this, we're and I'm new, so we're going to use some of my experience, I think, as an example to my peers, infantry regimental commanders, battalion commanders, their gunners, um, ops chiefs, you know, really company yeah. commanders, the audience that we are looking to say yes to said Marines to web stream battalion Quantico to start beginning uh, these packages in FY23, right? But so I was a CEO at ITB, uh, as you mentioned, and I started hearing about AMTP during normal briefs between second Marine division and uh, SOI. Started um, at least two years ago when the uh, the IMC course, the infantry Marine course came about, and that was really training command of the SOI's reaction to the CPG and trying to, now, and I wouldn't say try, I believe that they are, meeting the Commandant's challenge to develop elite infantry Marines. And as Gunnar mentioned, at some point, AMTP was selected as a package. So about in March, we were getting a, a good brief from uh, our friends over at SOI East, and then the regimental gunner, or school gunner, Joe Ezit, started talking about AMTP. And then I'd already been selected to go over to Webster Training Battalion. Um, the regimental gunners, the regimental commanders had seen this and you know came up to me and said, hey, have you seen it yet? And I was like, no, no, I haven't seen it got to get over there um, and you got to see what this is. So I, so uh, Colonel Dave, Dave Emmel, the CEO, you know, let me go out to K501. I linked up with one of the ITB companies uh, and Gunnery Sergeant Felshaw, who's their instructor chief. Um, and I just started off discussion like, hey, I'm not, I'm not being a jerk or anything, but I spent a lot of time as a company commander and a battalion commander on these very ranges, um, really, really working hard, trying to make sure that our Marines were as lethal and as capable as they could be, right? Um, I love my Marines. And and I was trying not to be emotional. Um, I was trying to be objective and I had had a lot of positive feedback um, from from my peers and gunners that I trusted over the division. But again, I, I think that sometimes when you say that there's a better thing, you could potentially assume that the thing you were doing was not as good. Um, and so I just started off with that. And, and then and so he started talking about, again, some of the things we've already discussed. Well, sir, um, like we're doing a one to 14 student to instructor ratio for all for all the parts and pieces of the infantry Marine course, but also for for AMTP. So that that was new. Right. Um, learner centric model, adult adult learning science. We did a lot of one over, you know, 200 lecture. Um, on on the ranges, the combat instructors uh, were PSOs and not necessarily instructors, so that piqued my interest. The topic of the instructors having to do 10 days of individual marksmanship training to master the POI prior to instructing it. That, again, as Gunnar mentioned, that that is new, was new prior, you know, you went to the rifle range and you did squad attacks with your, with your unit. Um, you did CMP tables, um, but again, was you just sort of did it with the unit and it may have scored, maybe wasn't scored, um, but you did it to complete it. So that was new and interesting. And then we walked over to, to the firing line. And again, it, it wasn't combat instructors as PSOs. It was a squad leader who happened to be a combat instructor with his squad of 14 Marines. And prior to going through the drills that Gunnar alluded to, that Marine, who's a, that Sergeant squad leader, who is a duty expert is providing specific, unique individual instruction on your stance, on how you're holding your weapon, how you're presenting your weapon, how to achieve, as Gunnar mentioned, that speed and accuracy. They had this little weird blue box thing that well, there was a buzzer. And I'm like, Gunny, what is that? That's a shot timer. What is that for? That measures how fast that, that they complete the drill and then com combined with the accuracy gives them their score. I was like, okay, wow, this is really new. And then there's an automated scoring system that we're using um, via ONR to capture the data, but all, also to give immediate real-time feedback to the shooter so they understand what they could have done better. I was like, okay, wow, this is really different. Um, and, and then it, it dawned on me again, going back to industrial <clears throat> age learning versus information age learning. I had focused both as a company commander and a battalion commander on processing a unit safely through a course of fire, right? Safely through tables three through six. We focused on making sure the students knew the, the movements, sort of like drill movements. Uh, and we were actually mostly focused on that to, to have them safely get through the range. We did spend a lot of time focused on scoring, manually scoring, day and night, 
but the cut line where you really got focused one-on-one -on -one individual instruction is when you failed the, the minimum standard, right? Like it was a graduation requirement. So when you were not good enough, you then got one-on-one -on -one instruction so we can ensure that you passed and we lowered our attrition rate. Again, with AMTP, everything is the way in which we do it is, is turned on, on its head. And the focus is making the individual as best as you can be. And if you, if you can be better, you know, faster and more accurate, then really the, there, ha there has to be some physical limitation, right, to how fast and accurate you can be. But it's focused on the best the shooter can be. Yeah. So that, that, that was really sort of my realization is I've come into this as, an, as the new guy versus what we were doing in the past. And it's definitely going, um, and scientifically speaking, mind you, um, we talk muscle memory. Mm -hmm. That's a neural pathway, right? That's what's happening in your brain. Like you're establishing this neural pathway. That's why you can drive a car and drink coffee at the same time. And you can still drive because you know, your decision-making abilities are still on. You don't need to waste that brain capacity on drinking the coffee, right? Yes, yeah, you just you built those, you've established those habits. Right, and so again, that's the perfect practice. So we all, everyone understands this, like, well, that's like, that's, you know, uh, evident, that's self-evident that multiple repetitions will build muscle memory. Like, but in practice, it's not. Like it's it just not like you have to do perfect practice to get that and to get it to where I can make decisions. Doesn't matter what the test is. I am still going to perform from a marksmanship perspective because this, I know how to ro reload a rifle rapidly at night. It's not going to be a thought game for me at that point. So that's really what it's trying to do. Um, how the inception of all this really came about from the uh, 2018, um, marksmanship lethality capabilities based assessment uh, and that came out i believe it was november of 2018. Um, the short version of that it it listed some um, common combat conditions where we suck at shooting just quite frankly that's where it ends um, it took a really good stab at defining um, lethality uh, in terms of human zones and what that what that means you know just because you hit them does not mean that you kill them um, not by a long shot. Uh, it's where you hit them. More doses of the medicine is, is usually a better answer. Um, and from that, we derived uh, the AIQ target, and that's the same target we use during AMTP uh, and the IMA. Um, but from that, Weapons Training Battalion, and um, alongside the Office of Naval Research, uh, Code 34, Marine Expeditionary Warfare, uh, they were looking, like, where, who's doing what? Right. Your inclination is to go like, well, what's SOCOM doing? Right. They went all over the place within DOD, law enforcement. And how do you train marksmanship and what are you doing? Um, they stumble upon a Air Force National Guard guy. This guy was like a staff sergeant. He's absolutely amazing. Um, but he was running this thing and he had developed some techniques and looked at this and, and got some input from other guys. And he was running this largely CQB based package. Um, O and I weapon training battalion at the time took it, they looked at it, and then they started to codify it. Because like any any other the high speed marksmanship thing, it's it's usually it's usually completely built off of the one guy mm -hmm. in his memory. So that's not going to be reproducible, and it's certainly not going to be reproducible at scale. Uh, so O and I and weapon training battalion took a stab at that. Like, how do we program this thing, so to speak? Um, so over the past couple of years, that's definitely was what um, that's what has been happening. What was fortunate is IMC that test comes up, so that's where O and I was able to embed AMTP into there, and we start running testing to see does this actually do something. Uh, spoiler alert: it does. So we've had um, I don't know how many thousands, oh, well over two thousand, I'll say, um, Marines go through IMC and execute AMTP. And so we have the pre and post test data. What also comes out of this is some, dare I call it, technological developments. Um, how to test this thing, they used, uh, O&I developed uh, this system called JMAP. So the Joint Marksmanship, Marksmanship Assessment Package. Uh, it's essentially a software program, a device, and a timer. We oversimplify it. Uh, but the amount of data that it can capture and the type of data is uh, immensely invaluable to the instructor. So within that, that's where we could see that um, the privates that are trained in I, uh, that, that are trained in AMTP 
they'll fire and hit two rounds before the private who's not trained in it even fires around. It's like that level of data. They further developed a, it's basically for those who know it, a Monte Carlo simulation. Um, they developed this modeling called the SPEAR model, uh, which is speed, precision, executive control, adaptab adaptability, and risk mitigation. What this thing essentially is, is the matrix. It's a gunfight. So they will take your pre-trained self, run you through the infantry marksmanship assessment, take your data, train you through AMTP, then take your post-test results. Your pre and post test guy is obviously expressed in ones and zeros and they fight each other and they fight each other hundreds of thousands of times. So they did that in the course of the IMC test. They did that at the individual level and they did that at the squad level. What ends up happening is because you, you can look at numbers, you can look at marksmanship numbers and it it can be lost on you. You just get lost in so many numbers and it's like, oh, great. He's two tenths of a second faster than this guy or he's he's, you know, 5% more accurate, right? The spear model tells you how would they do if they were fighting each other. The AMTP trained guys like a winning the vast majority of the time, like in, in some instances into the 90 percentile, like they're just crushing their opponents. Um, so that's where in terms of testing, we knew we like, this is, this is the thing. So it's a data driven. So any of these things we're talking about, it's not, they're not opinionated. It's not, you know, it's this fast because that's how I felt it should be. Or it's the best thing because it's the best thing that I've seen. Like, no, no, no. The data tells us, like, yeah, this thing's pretty hard to beat. Um, so that walks us into basically where we are uh, at this point in time. Um, sorry, I'm pausing. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. No, so actually, um, you're that thing about, like, the, you know, the PFC, the one who's trained, you know, like getting off the two rounds and the other guy hasn't even fired yet. Um, with, with the fact that you had – you know, 2,000 something Marines who've already gone through this, and you've got a pretty big data repository, I would think. What, based off of that, what is in, like increased lethality now look like under the AMTP? What are, what are you seeing that we didn't see before? Oh, how do I quantify this? Is a good, that's a really good question. Um, I'm trying to quantify this. Percentage, right? There's a, no. I would say, um, just as it relates, as it relates to lethality, um, if I can summarize it in the simplest way, they're actually hitting, they're actually hitting people and they're hitting people in the best place to ensure death. So like to put some teeth behind that, the IMA, for example, the infantry marksmanship assessment, this is their grad requirement. So you went through AMTP, you did these crazy training drills, which are hotter than the test. I'll tell you that now, they are hotter than the test. So then you do the IMA, um, IMA, you've got a 100 meter plate that's eight inches. You have a 200 meter uh, steel plate. Um, that's what they call an a, an, uh, a, a C zone size target. Um, I can't remember the exact dimensions, but it's like definitely within your face and fits within your chest. It's not a 19 by 20, and it's certainly not a 19 by 40. Small target. That's at 200 meters. And they have that same target at 300 meters. Clock starts from the standing position off a barricade. The Marine gets down, magnifies his optic in, if he so chooses, fires two rounds at the 100, shifts two rounds at the 200, gets up, gets in the prone, fires two rounds at the 300. That's all rapidly do it now. Like do it right now as fast as you possibly can go. The Marine that's been trained through AMTP he's doing that and he's shooting well the ones who aren't would not it's like not it's it's near impossible so if you look at that scenario it's like what am i telling you i'm telling you just i'll just throw average numbers well under a minute those marines are like killing three people right that's how you got to look at it and then when you look at the size of the targets that's where i say like they are killing those people an eight inch plate at 100 is a head that's a headshot um Again, the training drills are way worse than that. Like they're they're much they're much worse, and it's purposefully right. Like sweat and combat, bleed less in training, kind of thing. Um, are, are you able to talk about any of those training drills? Yeah. So I'll give you. A, so let's say the Long Bay, just because I gave you the um, I gave you the IMA example of um, uh, the Long Bay portion. Um, so the Long Bay for AMTP, uh, it's very similar. You'll have a barricade. And you'll be standing. Uh, your magnification is on one power. 
Uh, weapons on safe, obviously, and you're in a low ready position. Buzzer goes, you get in a kneeling position, eight inch plate at 100, got to hit it in seven seconds or less. Got to do it three times, three times in a row. So pow, 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 bing, you hit five seconds, reset, round two, reset, round three. Got to do it three times. Um, the time can get averaged, but once you blow over the time, that's it. It's gone. Like you failed. You failed this drill. Um, so again, if you, you know, hit once in seven seconds, once in eight seconds, once in 10 seconds, you failed the drill. Like you, you, you're not going to average out. Right. Um, the 300 stand, same kind of starting position, standing to prone 12 seconds, hit a 12 inch plate during the day. At night is where it gets a little different. Uh, the uh, target size and time for the uh, 100 meter is exact same. So eight inch plate within seven seconds. At night for the three, it'll be standing to prone in 12 seconds and the target just turns into that uh, BC zone steel uh, size target uh, as opposed to the 12 inch disc that's during the day. But again, still 12 seconds and that's under nods with a laser. But that's just right, that's like one one of the drills and one of the tests on the IMA. I'm taking your sort of like slow more piece with more and more a little bit earlier, but as you were sort of describing that as well as the fact that like the day doesn't end until the student, you know, finishes what they're supposed to. And that could be at 1600 or zero three the next morning. Um, as a, you also describe that this is, you know, this is a science, this is a data driven um, type program. So are there, are there things related to the marksmanship um, that are also being incorporated to improve the, the lethality of that shooter. And I'm thinking of things like, uh, like sleep cycles or nutrition or other kinds of music. Are those so what they're doing at IMC, I can't like fully outside of the marksmanship. I'm not going to speak to. Right. So I, I will tell you like generally, yes, IMC is advanced in a lot of areas, but I'm not an SOI representative. Okay. So when I do it, no, it's just the straight marksmanship. You will get the soup to nuts package of, day, night rifle and pistol. We, any um, other things that we are teaching them are still always related to marksmanship. Example, we have an extremely robust uh, terminal ballistics training that we partnered with uh, the FBI ballistic research facility to develop. It is not your standard terminal ballistics class. Um, we will show them what an M27 and M855 Alpha 1, which is our combat round currently, um, what that does to a target at distance. We start to talk about quantifying max, uh, max effective ranges in comparison to, um, you know, um, an ideal maximum range to engage a target as it relates to terminal ballistics. Uh, we'll get a little bit of wind calling, UKD, right? Like those kind of things, but they're still all marksmanship related. Okay. Um, so uh, I want to go back to actually uh, when you were talking about how you you could collect that data from the shooters and then run it through the Monte Carlo you know, yeah. hundreds of times and actually build like a, hundreds of thousands hundreds of thousands and yeah. so you basically got like an avatar now of the shooter that you can put against other shooters yep are you are have you been or are you able to collect shooting data about possible adversary marksmanship and put so, that in the simulator to see see how your new shooters that up against them? um that's a high side question. Yeah, that's a high side question. I wouldn't be able to answer yet, but I know that that's a high side question. Yeah, I, again, it, just, uh, yeah, yeah. Sounds so, like it would be a good thing. Simulations are compared the expert AMTP instructor against similar, or excuse me, AMTP students against similar AMTP students. Or, or bottom line, there were some sort of marine, yeah, da marine data versus marine data. Right, old way of doing business, yeah. the new way of doing business. The simulator showed new way of doing business. AMTP. So when they is yeah. a better hit rate. So if you get to like, is this going to work against a near peer competitor? I'll turn over to Gunner to explain. Yeah. So that. one it has just um, it's not exactly answering your question, but it's um, in the course of the IMC study, um, um, the SOIs were basically they would um, they were given artistic licensing, develop kind of your own methods, and then we're going to put your head to head and kind of see and write, try to take the best of both, right? A, a, a decent way of doing things, I think. Um, so one coast developed one method, one coast decided on AMTP, and that's where the initial data came from, from being head to head, right? So it's one thing to compare apples versus apples. The test definitely compared apples versus oranges, 
and there was like something completely different against AMTP, fought him head to head and was like, oh, here are the results. Like, this is mind blowing. Um, but theoretically, right, if you if you had a adversary force and we had marksmanship data on them, like, I'm yeah. sure you could input it in and see what would happen. Yeah, I mean, I, I just I ask because, you know, that, that's always sort of the aspiration, right, is figuring, figuring out how we can yeah. work against the opponent. And um, it's it's an aspiration and it's a huge challenge. And, you know, when we're, um, you know, some of the, the wargaming exercises we run here, like, you know, it's great if you're fighting your friends, right? But the real the real test of it is how do you how you perform against your adversary? But modeling that adversary, as we've also found, can be really, really hard. Absolutely, we, we often, yeah. We often mirror what like we mirror ourselves rather than what they can or can't do. Yep. Um, and you can't you can't uh, you can't keep up with the Joneses unless you go into their house, right? So like yeah, yeah that's you know, yeah, yeah. It's the only way to find out, right? Yep. And we, we can't just do that. We can't yeah. just go to our neighbor's house all the time. Yeah, I would love see to what see do. what the uh, uh, communist Chinese were doing for marksmanship and be able to yeah simulate that. I'd love to know that answer. I and this is this is too much of a tangent. We can we can cut it off. But as, as part of the program, is there research into you know what is openly available to adversary marksmanship training programs? Um, what they're doing? I would say not on my end. I would say not yet. Um, a few advancements, and I can and you know, team me up, I'll talk through the future on where this is going in a minute. Um, but I know I'll further, I'll try and further advance the program. Like I've got a pending meeting with like the Army Research Lab to go up there and, and uh, discuss with them just to flush out terminal ballistics more as well as capabilities. So I think I'll start to have some discussions in that zone with them. Um, again, I initially partnered with the FBI on it. The FBI is amazing. They do some amazing work in that regard. But it's, it's you know, their, their uh, scope of that problem is, you know, it's within their own house. Whereas the Army Research Lab can probably expand my uh, aperture a little bit on that one. Yeah, I was just kind yeah. of, out of curiosity. On that yeah. Um, so in, in talking about, you know, or what, what the future of this thing is, um, I'd say, you know, to both of you gentlemen, what has you excited about this program? Like it's, it's obviously been a lot of work to, um, to, to figure out what needs to be adjusted and then actually implementing it. And it sounds like I'm sure those those ten training days are very intensive, and uh, and you know physically, emotionally challenging for everybody. But you know, comparing to what we had before, what has you what you know excited about what this has to offer? In the I future? I think um, so. Again, gun of perspective, right? Um, when you're in the weeds, you can you know you can see what the proverbial right answer is, like fairly fairly easily, right? And we all could sit there and be like, oh, we should be doing this. And this is the way we should do things. And then there's just whatever life gets in the way and you don't do that. I feel that we're doing it right. Like with AMTP, like, and that's just like an oversimplification. So again, when we talk about like, yeah, sets and reps, everyone, it's like, no, no, we're diving way deeper than just mass sets and reps. We're actually doing that correctly. And we're showing the Marine how to do that correctly. And they're retaining it. They're actually able to perform. So the difference between from training day one to 10, they come out of there, they're straight killers, like unequivocally, like they're coming out of their straight killers. And I, from a trainer's perspective, they're leaving there and I'm like, all right, thank God. Like, that's just one less thing that I think we have to worry about. Like that kid can shoot, he's going to shoot them before they shoot him. Um, that for me, that's what it is, is that I, again, I feel that you know, we're doing stuff that we always try to do and preach and it's actually happening now. Yeah. I'm just, you know, with IMC again, we're not responsible for that, but for that and AMTP having been a former ITBCO, I'm just really excited to be allowed to, to work really hard to up the game of our infantry Marines. As we know, they, they do the fight on the dying um, a lot. And so that, to be able to, to take lessons learned, from 20 years Iraq, Afghanistan, helped the service pivot um, to fight a near peer uh, competitor. I think it's huge. I think it's also important to note, um, and you know, definitely proud to be the CEO, but all this was done before me, is when we get into the discussion of service marksmanship and infantry marksmanship, like the CBA was the rising tide that, lift, that, that lifted all ships. And we're gonna continue to the best of our ability to. Uh, to make sure that much like the ARQ, we can do everything we can uh, to improve service, um, lethality, 
small arms lethality to the service, we should. It's important to every Marine rifleman culture. But we're starting to be smarter about how to differentiate infantry TNR standards versus the service marksmanship order. And I think we can still focus on every Marine rifleman, but also offer advanced infantry skills. And procedurally, as Gunnar mentioned, as we program out AMTP, we just have to remember um, to do that. And then, and then, um, and that way, we do the best uh, for for both communities inside a small arms marksmanship arena. If that makes sense. Yes, sir. Um, actually, in in the chat just here from Albert Lee, who's a longtime recast audience member, listener. A question that actually kind of is like like the flip side of that, you know, what's excited you gentlemen about changes to the program? What have you seen about, you know, the, the feedback from the Marines who've gone through the program, right? Do, what do they feel that the program has done it's, for them? Has it- yeah, that's a great question. So um, the, the package that I run, right, is, is, is the most holistic form of it, right? So like um, the SOIs will run uh, a 90% form of that, um, meaning they don't do pistols. Right, there's infantry. There's not a requirement for them right now. Um, so, having said that, the the real feedback, the guys that I have, it's they walk out of there, they're riding high. Is just to, you know, simplify it. But I wanted to hear what the privates thought, right? So when I reach back to like regimental gunners down in the divisions, they're the ones telling me, talking to those Marines, that they walk out of there and they go unequivocally, "I know how to shoot, sir." Like confident like in 18, 19 year old kids are just straight looking at old crusty gunner in the face when he's asked like, Hey, what did you learn at ITP or at IMC? The first thing that they're telling them is like, I, I know how to shoot like just with utter confidence. And oddly enough, and I'm totally not making this up cause it'll sound like it. I was walking on the range the other day for a, a coach's course. And I meet Lance Corporal Canfield from eighth and I he's, um, he does the Dover detail and he's an infantry Marine. He's down here to learn how to be a coach. He went to SOI East and went through ITV, the, the basic infantry marine course, the two month course. And then apparently he was, some of the students were asked to volunteer to run through IMC and he volunteered to do IMC. So that, this young man went through two months of the old course and then 14 weeks of the new course, the old course had table three through six, what I described, the new course had AMTP and resoundingly without me prompting him, he, he basically said the same thing that Gunnar just did, better instruction harder test and I came out more time to shoot and I came out a better marksman. So uh, we're not, we're not making it up. And I think it's, and again, it's important to note all the science that, uh, that the gunner talked about this behind this as well. And I, I, you know, I'm doing the mental math on the time frames in my head here, as well as the number of people have gone through, but is, is there any data sort of longer term now? Like how do we know if people go through this course, have they performed better in their units like overall? Are they, is there a retention impact? Do we know anything about that? So we, yeah. j- we just, I'll say no. Um, no is the easy answer. Uh, so we just completed last week the uh, Combat Marksmanship Symposium, and we've got some recommendations as it relates to data collections and data collection programs uh, to CG uh, Training Command and CG uh, Training Education Command. But those recommendations will go out within the next week. But we're, so we're, we're we're trying to go after it in some capacity. Let's put it that way. Uh, but uh, right now, I would say no, no. I couldn't tell you how it's affected retention or anything like that. Yeah, no, and I, I realize there's probably a lot of unknowns just because two thousand might seem like a lot, but compared to the, the yeah, we're in, one of the things to note is, um, and this is um, kind of getting into the the future stuff. But again, control me and tell me whether to talk future now or not. Um, we can go into it now. Okay. Yeah, so. We're in a first, we have a first world problem right now. Um, PFC Costa is being trained in marksmanship better than Staff Sergeant Costa was. It's just a fact, like we made IMC and it's a good course and it does a lot of things and a lot of things differently. Um, To future this thing, we're really fixating on the rest of the infantry training continuum. Um, So that's like a lot of work's gotta be done in that regard. Like we have to start training the uh, fleet infantry. We start, we gotta start getting the elitists trained because they need to figure out how to sustain it. It's like, again, first world problem, they're getting Marines who know stuff that they don't. So how is that, you know, small unit leader going to be able to sustain that capability? First world problem, but a problem nonetheless. Um, 
we're looking at, we probably got to make the infantry marksmanship assessment. Um, probably got to get a couple of TNR tasks for that. Um, got to make a couple of POI like things for AMTP. And I say POI like uh, programs of instruction um, because the current construct, AMTP is not going to fit. Um, the current construct is how many hours do you need to teach, you know, grip and stance? Like how many hours for that? It doesn't work that way. Can't tell you. I know I need 10 days and I can do all this stuff in 10 days. Um, going uh, further, definitely uh, we want to start opening up our initial package and then uh, our instructor package to uh, FMF infantry. Uh, I know the SOIs are going to be working uh, to uh, look at AITB uh, to start implementing it there in some capacities, right? So uh, again, it's, it's kind of modular in the sense of who's your audience or what do they need? You know, do the staff and CEOs like going through IULC, do they need to go through the 10 days? I would say probably not. I think they need to understand it and know how to organize events to get Marines trained to it. Right. Um, but I think that's something that they'll be handling in the, in the very, very coming future. Um, and then lastly, um, Web Train Battalion Quantico owns the McReps, the rifle and pistol marksmanship McReps. We're in the process of updating those completely because they're woefully out of date and we got to get the AMTP program in there. Um, and I think that that's, that's the pathway forward for, for uh, the infantry writ large to be. We've just completely reset. We've redeclinated your compass, uh, but it's a heavy, it's a heavy lift. It's definitely a heavy lift. It's like staring a ship. It's definitely not going to happen overnight. Um, um, I think we need to look at the spare modeling um, and as well as JMAP and kind of, dare I say, operationalize those in, in, other, in other capacities for sure. Got to get JMAP in the hands of that, you know, platoon sergeant so he can run his guys through training, collect his data, analyze it, and actually make data-driven decisions. Again, what, what we do in combat, right? Intel-driven operations. Yeah. In training, we should be making data-driven decisions. So. Yeah, and I imagine apart from just the fielding of that capability that that platoon sergeant, they need to understand how to use this Thing, yeah, right? they didn't have yeah, yes, yeah, sir. First world problems, right? It's uh, it, I, I don't say that to diminish it. I, I say that to like, you know, again, it's a heavy lift, but man, we, we want to lift this thing. Like, let's, yeah, let's all get hands on this thing and, and get it the hell up. So, and Ian, I know we talked about this up front. If we had some time, talk, we, we could talk about like tasks from the CPG, et cetera. And you had mentioned at the beginning, like, you guys talk about a lot of uh, higher up, way ahead. I could if, basically using some of Gunner's analogies, like the current model of curriculum development doesn't fit and the, and the, and the comment on the CPG task training and education command to modernize what they're doing. Well, down at the training command level, they do have a policy, uh, it's a draft policy to modernize curriculum development. And some some schoolhouses within uh, within training command have done that. And we're going to sit down um, with McCass, who's done a lot of incorporation with Moodle um, for entry level students. I think more in line with what Gunner's talking about is how, how to how to document um, hours you need for curriculum, et cetera. So where, where I'm going is training fans actively working to make sure that when you go talk to you, your your academics officer, your learning and development officer, they don't make you change the way you want to teach something to fit the model. The, you know, the, the way in which we build curriculum will change to fit the adult learning mod, uh, adult learning science and methodology that Gunner's talking about. So again, a lot of good support from, from our boss uh, at training can to make sure that we can do the nuanced things that Gunner's talking about. Yes, sir. In fact, like when we were talking before, you described like, you know, I like the CPG and doing that. I mean, we, we were literally doing the same thing over here on the, on the educational side. We like, all right, what is, what is, you know, what is he telling us to do? And then how do we, how do we practically turn that into a thing that we offer, right? Rather than just it being, you know, high flying guidance on the page. What, what is it, what is the thing that we give them look like from that guidance? Yeah. Um, as, as well as, you know, the, uh, the, the heavy lift and, and is, you're talking about how many hours does it take, you know, six hours to do the, the grip? Well, I don't know, right? But I know what I want to see the outcome be. Yeah. That, that, that reminded me a lot of, we talked here about, outcome based learning type thing where, you know, I know what I want to see at the end, however long it takes me to get there. It's a day or 10 days. Great. But it's the outcome that I care about. It's not the number of hours yes, sir. that I spend teaching because those hours could be, you know, six hours could be, you know, 
really intense instruction and I'm not done or one hour could be good and the other five are just, you know, now we're just. Right. And it depends, it depends on the Marine, right? Like the, uh, the student, right. I've definitely seen that. There's some people one hour there, whew, that dude's the bee's knees. And then some people, yeah, they need that to, they need that hour 10 to, to get that locked in and burn in their brain, you know? And that's the rub. I mean, I think with sometimes you can overcomplicate marksmanship, right? And, and what it actually is it, at the end of the day, it, it's definitely um, foundationally, it's motor skills, right? It's being able to just perform these actions, understand why you're performing them and just do it again on demand. Um, in order to do that, right? You, you've got to look into that muscle memory, quote unquote, um, kind of aspect and how you get there. Uh, certainly, I know I, I talked with Owen R about this. This is a, probably a, a deep, deep, deep project, but like trying to figure that out and like quantify that. Um, how do you quickly develop, you know, muscle memory? What's the f quickest, most efficient way to figure that out? Because that I think that applies to not just, you know, an M27 and an M18 pistol. That can probably apply to a whole oh, family of... Plus. And anything your muscle, muscles do. Right. right. And that's, and when you, you know, you, you start at that level, um, you know, you can have a command, a commander with a great plan, a plan of attack. If this is all, this is the perfect plan. And if the Marines don't know how to do, you know, just those basic skills, well, the attack's not going to go like, it's just not, we're not going to make it. Right. And so I think, I think that's probably a broader, um, uh, you can apply it a lot broader, but that's something that, uh, uh, I think Warren's looking into for sure. Okay. So um, we are getting close to an hour here, but I do have, uh, there's a couple more questions in the chat here and they're kind of related. So I do want to get them out because they, um, they, they're they both sort of future orient, oriented as well, but they also look at strictly outside of the infantry, the Marine infantry community. Um, so I'll try and tie them together in a coherent fashion because I think they are related. So the first one is uh, again from Albert Lee asking whether ally and partner nation forces that train with Marines are going to have access to or have their marksmen go through? I wouldn't. I wouldn't be able to say that now. I don't think that's. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to say. Uh, yeah, no, I, I'm not aware of a foreign program. We did have the um, the colonel in charge of British Royal Marine uh, Commando School came down. and We talked about a lot of things. We are going to. We're going through the FDO press process right now mm -hmm. to make sure that they understand and can get access to the spear documents. And the CBA, they're they're unclassified. Um, okay. We're still going through those process. So, yes, we're working on at least making sure that uh, that, that that our our friends over in the in the British Royal Marine Commandos have access to the information. And then we'll see where that goes. But there's just like, you know, two MEF to three CDO inside of training command. There's a lot of good back and forth and cooperation with the commando. So we are thinking about that. Yes, sir. I mean, that makes sense. Where this is very early on this whole thing so then second question here from jared duff and this is going into again the future of every marine or rifleman um but if if you could maybe expand a little bit more on um for the, those non-infantry mos units um what 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 impact this is going to have on task condition standards for their own annual required training and the context of this is uh, the future stand in force will probably have a pretty good spread of those non infantry MOS personnel. So for, for that rising tide lifting on those boats, right? What is, what is yeah. this, what's the knock on effect for this, for those non infantry MOS folks? So right now, um, the focus is strictly on the infantry. And I say like, um, yes, every Marines rifleman, which is we've recently updated the annual call with ARQ, right? Um, so we went away from table one and table two, which was very much a, um, a good entry level course of fire, um, but we've, you know, increased their training by giving them that. Um, every Marine is a rifleman, but not every Marine is an infantryman. So we're, we're just prioritizing. We're, who do we know is required to kill people? Who has that in their mission statement? Mm -hmm. And it's like, they do. They unequivocally have to get this now. I think as the future goes, right, we update McRips and the techniques right, that we're employing an AMTP, I think it starts to get out into the force, but that turns into another thing, right? Like we'll have to take this and now focus efforts on updating it everywhere else. Do I think it'll be a one-to-one? -one? I don't. And, and that kind of harkens back to um, how we've applied marksmanship training for 
the infantry, there are times that we've applied it to the entire force. So sometimes that can result in, it's just not exactly what we would want to do for the infantry. And in some instances, maybe, ooh, we're, we're asking a lot of this type of a unit, right? Um, so I think we have to decouple that a little bit for the time being and say, what do we know the infantry needs? This is what they need. What do we learn from that? And when the time is right, we then say, yep, let's start giving this piece, that piece, and this piece to the force at large. But and, and I think, too, we also have to realize that, I mean, the commandant service has gotten only infantry Marines, only 0311s. The SCO and I are PS31 Bravos are fielded to infantry battalions. And I don't fully understand the fielding plan, but that is not $15,000 a pop. That's not a thing that's going to go. Um, you know, to, to my old battalion, headquarters battalion, to, to truck company um, because of the specific skill set. But just like Gunnar mentioned, when, you know, we went through this whole discussion when we were redoing the division medal, like, whoa, we don't want to do stability ops, and now it's moved. We're not shredding that doctrine. We're just putting it back on the med on, on the, the, the Marine Corps task list. We're just not putting it at the division level. Same thing as, as this develops, if I'm, you know, as we better figure out what EABO is or what, how you know the MLR is going to be operationalized, and there's a TNR task. That doesn't mean that you know CG three MAF or one MAF or third MARDIF can't say for these Marines, I, I want I want them to be able to do these TNR tasks. Or you know every base has has a, a SWAT team, for lack of a better term. It doesn't mean that folks couldn't pull down the TNR tasks and then work with with the resident schoolhouse to get school seats. But again, as Gunner mentioned. Really, we, we haven't gone past too much the, the IMCs, and we want to um, continue on the, the path that, that we're on. But these are all good questions, and, and, and it'll keep folks at Weapons Training Battalion busy for, for the next couple of years. And, and of note, this, is, um, this also brings in some parity between officer enlisted training. Like, IOC is doing this as well. Again, they do their version, mm -hmm. the, given their constraints and restraints. Uh, but a year ago, um, my guys and I trained their staff and they've implemented it and they're running it. They're running a version of AMTP and they execute the IMA. That is where there is some quantifiable, um, even on, I shouldn't even say that, that's also true in the SOIs, but um, some quantifiable effects from this thing is um, whether you're an SOI or whether you're an IOC and they're shooting at automated targets. So whether it's a, uh, a, a robot target that moves or what we would call like the pits targets that just bob up and down, the instructors have to set them for higher hit bob ratios because they're just being decimated, like absolutely decimated. Like the targets will not pop up because the Marines are just constantly hitting them. They've also have seen some level of ammo expenditures reduce because they're hitting more. So I should have thrown that to you earlier when you brought it up. But um, yeah, that's just, I don't know, some of the stuff that's currently going on. Yeah. And I, as much as I would really love to get into the robot targets, uh, this is everything we're um, we're kind of running out of time because we're about over an hour here. Um, but no, I think the, you know, I mean, just, it makes sense to start with, you know, who, who has marksmanship is their job and that's the infantry, right? But also that decoupling, you know, I can understand that, you know, especially, and going back to the context of the stand in force, right? Like, do I need, you know, maintenance Marines for an expeditionary, you know, airfield or a squadron? Do I need them to do the whole MTV? Maybe not, but maybe there's a separate bucket I can teach them. Yeah. How do I defend sure. that? Airfield, yeah. Yeah. Right? Like Absolutely. That could be yeah. Absolutely. Something that you yep. to make sure and not by then in charge of multiple units that weren't good at this, but like make sure that folks go to the rec range and we use up all the quotas. Yeah. yeah. Right. Then because we're one of the only services still ever Marines a lot rifle and that requires annual service rifle qualification. But yeah. And we've done that with equipment. Right. I feel like within my lifetime, that was like kind of an, a novel concept. Right. Like the infantry doesn't get the same PPE as uh, most other non infantry units because we've saw that requirements are different. The way they perform this mission is different. We need this. Right. So, yeah, but no, I think that making the argument that different groups, you know, different buckets of individuals, different categories of folks, you know, just like you're tailoring the training to the capability yeah. of the individual, different groups of individuals, different units are going to have different needs. Yeah. Sure. And that's okay. And like, we want to optimize them in the thing that yeah. they need to do instead of it's, you know, like I wrote it down somewhere. I want to know it's like your, the initial thing was you're, you're getting everybody, but like that baseline yeah. of them safely through the course, right? That's sure. the baseline. Mode. 
that's not optimizing the individual yeah drill down yeah yeah and where possible and you know folks figure out based on you know troop to task or you know there's no, there's nothing saying that good ideas eventually can't tra translate from from this program to other programs it's just got to you know commanders have to decide um, training command of service has to decide on, you know, in, in, if you're not in the infantry bin, what tasks come off the plate um, to to focus on marksmanship. Right. And, and that's the challenge, too. Yeah. Like something you got to give it up. Some you want something new, you got to give up something else. So. Um, OK, well, gentlemen, we've been we're over an hour here. Um, I don't have any other questions in the chat. I'm happy to give you any, any final thoughts, comments you'd like to share. With no, the no, I appreciate um, I appreciate the time for sure. Um, and just getting some of the information out there and just I'm um, trying to keep people informed on, you know, what what has happened, what is happening, and what will happen, hopefully, right? Yeah, no, we're excited, and thanks for the opportunity. And as Gunnar mentioned, FY23 school seats are open, so we definitely would like to fill those up. Um, and we certainly be more than happy to come back as, as things progress and, and, and keep you and your audience updated. But thank you for the time. Yes, sir. No, I think it'd be great if we do a, you know, 2023 update and see where, where we've gone. You know from today so to uh colonel jones gunner costa thank you very much for your time and coming over here and you know i'll throw a marker on the calendar for a 2023 update and to those of us in the audience uh, thanks for joining us today i hope you enjoyed the knowledge in this episode a lot, a lot of this stuff is new and very interesting to me so i hope uh, i hope it's the same to you and we also offer this as the recruiting pitch for those quotas go fill those quotas that the web training battalion has um, in terms of things that are coming up, we're going to have another down the rabbit hole in the Russia Ukraine war coming out here probably in the next couple of days. And then the broadcast will be off next week, but we will be back the following week, uh, second week in November. And we're already chewing on uh, doing an update on what's been going on in uh, Iran because uh, there, there's a lot of dynamics at play. And our Middle East studies professors, Dr. Tarzi and Dr. Anzalone, are going to help us understand exactly what's going on there. So, we hope you're following us on email or social media for those episodes. And again, thank you for joining us. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.